All right, well, welcome, welcome. Uh, amphitheater foyer is what we call this. So we're going to be here, hopefully. Uh, got a meeting with a church. I mentioned it earlier, after church today, about util utilizing their building. Um, so be in prayer for that. That's hopefully we can do something in the midweek there. We'd like to stay here because uh, we have restrooms and we can start the children's ministry next week. Um, that's something that's been just on my heart, you know, the kids just not being able to gather 
and they get bored as all get out not being able to go to school and parents having to just endure with all of that. So that would be just neat for them to be able to meet and gather and hang, hang out with us. So be in prayer for that. Next week we have the uh, men's breakfast and women's breakfast on Saturday. Men meet at 9 a.m. at Brian's house and the women meet at Ron and Gabriella's house at 10 a.m. Uh, they like to sleep in, I think. And so the difference in times, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., um, get with Roxanne or go to the website, CC Living Water. If you want any information, you can get with Brian uh, on the men's. Anything else, Brian, that you know of? Okay, Tuesday night, we'll continue to meet. Right now, we're at Angel's house. We're thankful that she has opened her door. She's right up the street, and that's prayer meeting. Uh, 6.30 to 7 is a time of reflection. 7 to 8 is a time of prayer. And then on Wednesdays, we've been meeting at Ron's, so we'll continue to meet there until uh, the Lord opens something else up for us. Cool? If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 5. The title of the message is What's in a Name? What's in a Name? Genesis, first book in the Bible. So we've been going through the Bible on Sundays. We hit up Genesis. It's going to change, but first and third Sunday of the month, we do Genesis. Oh, on second and fourth Sunday of the month, we go through the book of Revelation. Just something crazy, right? Let's go through two books on Sunday. We're going to go through the whole books, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So right now we find ourselves in Genesis. We, chapter 1 was the story of creation. Chapter 2 narrowed it down to uh, the pinnacle of creation, the apple of God's eye, humanity. And so we had... Um, Adam and Eve focused in a little more and being in the garden in paradise and communion with God. Chapter 3, we get a snake slither into the garden, into paradise, and through deception and sin, we see the world catapulted into sin. Chapter 4, we see the first murder, and then we see the repercussions of the sin of chapter 3 and the enemy, the serpent, the devil coming in. And I just find it interesting, God restores with Seth something that was lost. And so Adam and Eve, they have their fourth, third child that's mentioned, Cain, Abel, and then um, Seth, A Cain was first? Yeah, Cain was first, Abel, and then Seth. So now we're going to have this genealogy, and that's all it is, really, chapter 5, a record of names. And so sometimes when you're reading through the Bible, you know, you'll get to a genealogy and you'll wonder, gosh, what's... What's in a name? Like, like, I don't know. I just You read through it and you get through it. And so we're going to get through it. It's going to be a quick, short study. But then again, I'm a pastor, so I lie. And um, it'll probably be a real long study. But I think it's going to be a short study because I'm just going to read you some names on a page. <laughs> I don't even know how many verses this is. I mean, 32 little verses of names. So as we go through that, I'll share with you what I believe the Lord has laid on my heart this week in what's in a name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, everything will be fulfilled. Every jot, every tittle, every dot of the I, every crossing of the T. And so Lord, we believe that this is your inspired word. Lord, we believe that the books within the Bible are inspired by you, that this is God's word, your word to us. Lord, we believe that the words in each chapter are inspired. Lord, I'll go as far as to say the spaces in between each word is inspired by you. And so thank you for your love letter, Lord. Thank you for your word. Open up our ears. Give us eyes to see what your spirit is saying as we lift this time up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can, I, can you hear me on this mic? Or, yeah? Lorraine, can you hear me back there? All right, Lorraine can hear me. All right, so this is Genesis chapter 5. We're moving on. In this account, whoa, these words are really small. Hold on, I can't even see. Oh my, whoo. There we go, so much better. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them 
and called them mankind in the day that they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And so this would be the third son mentioned after Cain and Abel. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. You'll see as we go through the genealogy that they lived about 900 years, 900 and some odd years. Um, and again, I believe that that's what the Bible says. I believe that's what it was. Things will change. You're not going to get through, you're not going to be able to get through six chapters in the Bible where God's going to have to wipe out the entire world. He's going to have to hang it up. He's going to say in Genesis chapter 6 that every thought of mankind was continually evil all the time. So many just, man, like just words that describe this elevated state of wicked hearts. And so God is going to find, or Noah's going to find grace, and God's going to start over with him and his family of eight. Him, his wife, his three kids, and their wives. But again, you can't get through five, six chapters before God has to say, we, we, I, do over. We got, we got to do this all over. And so we can see just what's going on in our world right now and the confusion that exists and how everything, everybody is doing like the book of Judges, what's right in their own eyes. And they're, they're wanting to argue and they're wanting to just prove these points of Unless you're standing on the Bible, you got zero foundation and leg to stand on. If your opinion is just as valid as my opinion, then I guess we can argue. But your opinion, in my opinion, really means next to nothing if it doesn't conform to God's. Because God's not wrong. And we can be very wrong. We go on. Verse 6, Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. He must have been Hawaiian, right? After he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Jared. Is Jared the guy that used to do the subway commercials? Yeah. So I thought. And he begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. And so Enoch breaks the chain of living, begotting, and then dying. He doesn't die. He's walking with God 300 and some odd years. And then God takes him. He translates him. He raptures him. He's a type of the church. And just that picture of the rapture. Because judgment is coming. And he's taken out before the judgment comes. So Enoch breaks the pattern of life where God just translates him and takes him home. It goes on. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 700, this is verse 26. Oh, verse 25. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. 
Now, Methuselah is the oldest recorded living human being in scriptures. 969 years. Old dude, right? Just an interesting observation. Verse 29, and he called his name. So he had, Lamech lived 182 years and had, son, uh, had a son, 28 says. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. All the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so we come to the end of the account of humanity. We have a genealogy given to us. And I remember hearing a study um, on the names that are in the Bible, and specifically this chapter, pretty impressive, how you begin to look at the names and the significance of the names. The name Methuselah means that before um, he dies, the judgment will come. I, I, I just find that interesting. And yet he lives the longest, right? Recorded in the Bible, the longest, the oldest. And it's just a picture of God's mercy where before the judgment comes, he's just allowing for more time for people to be able to get it, if you will, to understand. And so I'm not quick enough to figure a lot of this stuff out. I'll study things that Chuck Missler put out and that John Corson puts out. And I remember even my buddy Fish, Pastor Fish at Calvary Chapel Downey, put out a study and gave all of these names and their significance. So, so let me give you a few of them because we could end there. I could pray, we could worship, have communion and call it a day. But I do have a little more. That'd be a quick study, huh? That'd be like, yeah, Whoo, let's go eat breakfast. But no, we got a few names. So what's in the, a name? Methuselah comes from Muth, a root that means death, and from shalak, which means to bring or to send forth. The name Methuselah means his death shall bring. So his death shall bring, Methuselah. Methuselah's father was given a prophecy of the coming great flood and was apparently told that as long as his son was alive, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. But as soon as he died, the flood would be brought or sent forth. It is interesting that Methuselah's life, in effect, was a symbol of God's mercy in foretelling the coming judgment of the flood. Therefore, it is fitting that his lifetime is the oldest in the Bible, speaking of the extensiveness of God's mercy. And so if Methuselah's name has such significance, what about the, the other names? If we were to take them one by one, Adam, his name means man as the first man that seems straightforward enough. And then you have this lineage that's going to lead to this coming one. But before that, God's going to wipe them out, use Noah. And so we're going to get to Noah through these generations. After Adam, you would have Seth, which means appointed. Eve said, for God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain had slew. Enosh, the next name, sons of Seth's son was called Enosh, which means mortal or frail or miserable. It is from the root Anosh, to be incurable. It is used of a wound, grief, woe, sickness, or wickedness. It was in the days of Enosh that men began to defile the name of the living God. And we saw that last time in chapter 4 in the book of Genesis. Kenan, or Kenan, Enosh's son was named Kenan, which means sorrow, dirge, or elegy. The precise denotation is somewhat elusive. Some study aids unfortunately presume that Kenan is synonymous with Canaan, and that's how we read it in the New King James. So Canaan, and it means sorrow. Balaam, looking down from the heights of Moab, uses a pun upon the name of the Kenites when he prophesies their destruction. And so a play on words in the book of Numbers. We have no real idea as to why these names were chosen for their children. Often they may have referred to circumstances at birth and so on. And so their names would be foretelling. Their names would be able to be prophetic. Their names would be able to help us to look into the future. Mahalalel, Kenan's son from Mahalalel, which means blessed or praise, 
and El, the name for God. Thus, Mahalalel means the blessed God. Often Hebrew names include El, the name of God, as Dan I L, Daniel, God is my judge, etc. Jared, Mahalalel's son, from the verb Yarad, meaning shall come down. Enoch, Jared's son was named Enoch, which means teaching or commencement. He was the first of four generations of preachers. In fact, the earliest recorded prophecy was by Enoch, which amazingly enough deals with the second coming of Christ. And it's quoted in the book of Jude. We heard Brian as he's teaching on Sunday just finish the book of Jude. And I was thinking about it. Encourage you to get that. Brian, what did you do? Five studies through Jude? Five or six, huh? So five studies going through a one chapter book, but he took it bit by bit. And within there, he's talking about all this stuff that we're looking at in Genesis. He's talked about um, the type of the rapture. He typed about uh, Enoch and all of that. So the verses, Jude 14 and 15, it says, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these sayings, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten, thousand, ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them all, of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against. And so a prophet pronouncing the judgment of God was Enosh. Methuselah, Enoch was the father of Methuselah, who we have already mentioned. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah, verse 8 told us. Or, I don't know what verse that was. Apparently Enoch received the prophecy of the great flood and was told that as long as his son was alive, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. The year the Methuselah died, the flood came. Enoch, of course, never died. He was translated, or if you excuse the expression, raptured. That's how Methuselah can be the oldest man in the Bible, yet he died before his father. So if you ever hear the riddle, or the, you know, the, whatever that's called, a riddle, yeah. Lamech, Methuselah's son, a root still evident today in our English word lament or lamentation, Lamech suggests despairing. So this is also the name linked to Lamech in Cain's line who inadvertently killed his son Tubal Cain in a hun hunting accident. Finally you go to Noah. Noah, Lamech of course, the father of Noah, which is derived from Nakam, to bring relief or comfort as Lamech himself explains in Genesis chapter uh, Five, verse 29. And so we look at these names and we think, wow, okay, so all those names have meanings. And as we go through the names, that's interesting stuff. I guess for people who lived in their time, and if you know anything about the Bible, it's 66 books separated by the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, the first covenant that God gave to the nation of Israel using Abraham as the chosen one that would declare the good news to the world. And through this one nation, the light of the world was supposed to come and people could be saved by turning to God and looking forward to a deliverer. And then you have the, Old Test the New Testament that declares Jesus, right? Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospels. He's born in a manger. And we have all of that account, the doctrines of the New Testament. The first five books of the Bible are called the, the Torah or the Law. And you would imagine that these Hebrews would put together a book with these names and have it mean the significance that it means. The Hebrew name, Adam, man. The Hebrew name, Seth, English, appointed. Enosh, mortal. Canaan or Kenan, sorrow. Mahalalel, the blessed God. Jared, shall come down. Enoch, teaching. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, the despairing. Noah, rest or comfort, if we put it in a sentence, it reads like this, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. What? What? No. That can't be, right? You look through names and you read and that's kind of where we nod off. That's kind of where we like, all right, I'm done. I got to go to John. I got to go to John's gospel. I can't with the Bible anymore. What are these names? But you dig a little and you recognize that way back when God chose in the first book in the Bible to put the gospel that we would 
despair, that we would sorrow, that we would go through difficulty. But God had a hope. He had a plan, a redemptive plan in place from the very beginning, knowing that there would be 2,000 years, really 3,000, but if we start from the beginning, 4,000 from Adam, but from Abraham, 3,000 years of history until we got to this promised one. And they would get saved by looking forward to that promised one. We today get saved by looking back to that same promised one. Right here in the scriptures, the implications of this discovery are more widespread than is evidence at first glance. It demonstrates that in the earliest chapters of the book of Genesis, God had already laid out his plan of redemption for the predicament of mankind. It is a love story written in the blood on a wooden cross which is erected in Judea almost 2,000, well now 2,000 years ago. As I read through the Bible and I study and I come across characters in the Bible, I oftentimes want to relate to the heroes of the faith. I really do. I look at a Paul and just a mental giant. Just, just so, his ability to communicate. And I so want to gravitate. And then I realize, yeah, you're not that bright, bro. Calm down. I look at Peter and, you know, just the foot and mouth disease where he opens his mouth and sticks his foot in it. And I'm like, oh, I'm probably a little more like Peter sometimes as I look at it and kind of just look at these characters. But there's one person in the Bible that I relate to more than any other. His name is Methuselah. He's found in the book of 2 Samuel. He's introduced in 1 Samuel. David would come on the scene after he would gain the throne. He was given it a long time. Samuel the prophet would anoint him to be the next king, second in line next to Saul. Saul and his son Jonathan would die in a battle. And so David would take the throne. And David cleans house and he, he gets his affairs in order and he's moving in the right direction. But he had made a promise to Jonathan, to the king Saul's son. And he tells Jonathan, hey, why don't we make this pact? Why don't we make this deal? If I take the throne, I'm going to show kindness to your family. But if you take the throne, then you show kindness to my family because you're the next heir. You're the son of the king. You're probably going to get it, but, but let's make this deal. And so Jonathan and King Saul die. And nine chapters later in 2 Samuel, David says, hey, I remember that promise that I made to Jonathan. And so he begins to seek out in the kingdom, is there anybody left in the house of Jonathan that I may show the kindness of God, favor from God to and this guy says, yeah, there's this guy in Lodabar, Methuselah, Lodabar, is barren, arid, dry, desolate, nothing to speak of. Again, you look at the, the definitions of these words, and that's where, Meth not Methuselah, I said Methuselah, Mephibosheth is hanging out. So Mephibosheth is hanging out in a dry and arid, desolate place. His name means lame shameful one. And as much as I might not want to relate to somebody who's shameful, somebody who maybe the world would look on and maybe not a esteem, that's really who I am. Through and through, if we're honest with ourselves, if we're true to ourselves, the problem that we have is we have a tendency to compare ourselves to one another. And in doing that, what we usually do is we, we find somebody struggling and we feel a little better about ourselves. But if there's going to be a point of comparison, the Bible says that we're to compare ourselves to the perfect one. The standard for heaven, the standard for eternity is perfection. It's righteousness. And so our point of comparison is supposed to be none other than the Son of God, Jesus Christ. If you want to compare yourself to somebody and see how you line up to God's standard, Jesus Christ is your standard. And we all fall short of His glory. We all find ourselves shameful. Living in dry and desolate places. And so David seeks out this Mephibosheth. 
and he finds out that he's lame in his feet. How did Mephibosheth get lame? Well, generally speaking, when a king comes on the scene, he wipes out the family and all of the heirs to the throne or potential heirs. And so his nurse, Mephibosheth's nurse, is running, fleeing from the king, and she drops him. And he ends up paralyzed in his legs. And again, that's us. Adam dropped a bomb on us, the Adam bomb, right? <laughs> he catapulted us into sin, and there we are, lame. We don't have a walk. We can't walk. We can't stand up straight before God. Again, this world will one day stand before God. And they will either stand in their own righteousness, which they do not possess, or in the righteousness of another. So, David brings him to his castle, to the palace. And he says, hey, I want to show kindness to you because of another who died. I, I want to show love to you. And I want you to sit at my table every day. And I want you to have a spread. And you know what my table's going to do? My table is literally going to cover your shame. It, it, it's going to cover the fact that you can't even walk. Nobody's even going to see it. Nobody's going to recognize it. Because every time I eat at the table, you're welcome to come and join me at that same table. And that table will cover your shame. And so that's who I identify the most with in the Bible. He's my favorite guy in the Bible. Mephibosheth. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but that's how I say it. Mephibosheth. And so I encourage you, we find ourselves in the same place as Mephibosheth. We find ourselves where Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And every time we come to the table, every time we're reminded, guys, we will search this world over for satisfaction. We will live this life out in vain, thinking that this trinket, that, experience this thing over here is going to be the thing that is going to finally meet the longing of my heart meet the need that is deep within me but until we pull up to the table of the king in recognition that he has done something that covers our shame and nakedness but more than that he invites us to this table as a reminder to remember what is significant in this world what is meaningful in this world. This world has a way of just clouding life and confusing and, and I don't know, it's like rabbit trails we find ourselves on. And we chase and we go after and we're so distracted so often and God says pull up to my table over and over. You have access to what is significant, to what is valuable, to what will satisfy the longing of your heart. And that's our endeavor. That's what we need to be reminded of. That's what we need to come back to time and time again, over and over, the table of the Lord. Even as we sing that song that Jesus fights our battle, wins it for us, brings the head of our enemy, and then gives us credit for winning the battle? We get the credit for the victory when He did it all? Man. What a deal. I call it the great switcheroo. He made him who knew no sin to be sin, that you and I would become the righteousness of God in him. We will stand before God one day, and we will give an account. And the only thing that we have to say is, Lord, I stand in the righteousness of another. I stand in the perfection of the one who took my place on the cross. I have nothing in and of myself but shame and nakedness and I live in a desolate place but I present to you the righteousness of my King of Kings and my Lord of Lords. And guys, we've got to come back to that daily. We've got to come back to that weekly. We've got to come back to that all the time to remind ourselves what are we living for? 
What is, what is this life all about? It's got to be about Jesus. It's got to be about what He's done for us. And living life out in gratitude for what He's done. What's in a name? Incredible that God would put the gospel, the good news, the Evangelion is the word. And I kind of say it Latin like it's uh, Spanish, but you know, it's, it's Greek. Evangelion, something like that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your plan. And Lord, as we pull up to the table, may we be reminded that not only, Lord, do you cover our shame, Lord, you know, you know that we walk with a limp. You know that we are affected by the past. The falls in life But Lord, not only do you cover it, you pull us up to your banqueting table. And Lord, all we have to exclaim is, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. What, what an awesome, awesome exchange. And Lord, may we live out in gratitude for what you've done for us. Having a relationship with you being able to walk and talk with you as we receive the gift that you offer. In Jesus' name, amen.